Anyway. Uh, what, Vic, what was his elevation uh, compared to nearby neighbors? Was he okay. higher than everyone else? He is higher than everyone else, okay? Uh, there's a high, uh, an internet company that has a tower on his property that has a taller tower. So they have a high tower for doing wireless internet. And then Steve has a 60 foot tower that is lower, but Steve has a lot of hardware at the top of that tower. A full size HF beams, six meter beam, two meter beam, vertical antenna, um, dipole antennas, etc. So there's there's a lot of surface area that Lightning would be interested in. Here's a, an example of, can everyone see that? That's a, a, a Lightning arrestor and it's a type N connectors. And then there's an element on top here. I'll just unscrew it. So you can see there's an, uh, this element in the hand. That's what's rated for wattage, this little one in my hand that I'm moving. And then it screws into the base or the actual arrestor itself. And these can be replaced because you don't need to have a lightning strike necessarily to blow one of them. If you have a lot of uh, static buildup during a windstorm that generates a lot of, of uh, static electricity of sufficient voltage, it can, uh, it can uh, burn up. Yeah, burn basically up fuse. yeah it's basically a fuse. Yeah, it's basically a fuse. Yeah. So it's one, one use, uh, it gets uh, activated and it's blown. And can you test the, uh, the gas uh, charge? Uh, yeah, the, ga the, the, the gas discharge too can be tested after the fact, but you'd have to have some sophisticated, you'd have to have something that lets you generate the variable voltage to see if it's still good to the rating that it's supposed to be. So in well, other words, the, you want the ones that we installed, Vic, the ones that we had installed, when they get uh, struck, they short the ground. Yeah. So it's obvious that they're, they're blown. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. you, yeah you, you know that they're blown right away. Uh, uh, speaking, go ahead. Metal, well, metal oxide varistors too, when, you know, they can get beat up over time. Yeah. You know, like uh, they, you know, they don't, might not immediately fail. Like uh, Jerry Kitts in Manitowning had a uh, uh, Astron power supply. He got hit by lightning and it, it just destroyed that metal oxide varistor just blew the crap out of it and I replaced the, the, the MOV and everything was good. So, but uh, they might not physically look damaged, but they can, you know, mm -hmm. definitely yeah, it's, it's It depends safe. though on the varistors that you get, eh Vic? Because the ones I used on the farm, I was on the end of the long line of the hydro lines and they're the worst with the transformer sitting up there. So if that lightning coming down there got nowhere to go that's a dead end. Used to take out the fellow's equipment across the road who had the dairy farm. But I had varistors that I used because I used to service the welders and the spot welders and uh, GM there. Mm -hmm. And they're going. And they were probably half inch thick and about the size of a silver dollar. Okay. And go like that with the lines. And I put them across from the hot to the neutral. Okay. Which tied the ground to go like that. And he'd blow out all his motors across the road there. And we're tied on the same line like that. And I wouldn't have anything in the house and I had all my ham equipment, but I did get hit with what you're saying. Lightning will jump. I had 400, I'm a little shy of 400 foot wire, long wire out. Cause I was on two acres where the house was. And then the rest of it was farmland, 106 acres of farm. But in that line came in there outside. I had a four inch knife switch, big, heavy copper knife switch, go like that. I would open that up and then I had inside, you had the jumpers where you pull the plugs out. And mm -hmm. when that lightning hit, I had a TH7 sitting up on top of a 65 foot tower. And we're just south of number seven, which is all gravel up there. So it's perfect for, <laughs> for getting a hit, eh? And it three feet down from the TH7, turned the coax right inside out, blew it right out, just 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 like a flower, eh? like a rose. Like eh? cauliflower. Right yeah, turned it into cauliflower, coming down like that. The long wire brought, it jumped right across, went across the open knife switch, went across everything. 
uh, coming in there. And, but on my tower, I used welding cable. Okay, and it was big. And on each leg, I had that sloped down and I had two ground rods, one right aft, off the concrete. And then another one, probably 18 feet out. And so there's six ground rods from the tower. And that's probably what saved the house, really, is going like that. But I, I find air lightning, boy, I'll tell you, it's kind of just like water. It'll run everywhere it can run. <laughs> and it doesn't seem to matter what you do in there. Lightning, if, it's, if, if you're in a direct strike of something like that, then, boy, I don't care what kind of grounding you got on there. It's going to turn everything, as you said, Bob, into cauliflower. <laughs> that's just about what it does. Well, wow. once it came down 12 miles, uh, an extra two feet is not going to make any difference. No. <laughs> no, and no. and if you're in the vicinity, very close vicinity of a lightning strike, uh, the uh, temperature around that lightning strike, the conductors, will go up to 5,000 degrees. So we'd be cooked if you were standing next to a, a conductor that was getting lightning through it. Anyway, I was going to make one Terrible. more point. This, a lot of the information that I've discussed here, oh, you, you're seeing this backwards, aren't you? Oh, grounding and bonding. Yeah, oh, okay. looks good. Okay. Oh, I'm the only one seeing it anyway. So the, the point is, this, <laughs> this is a AR, ARRL, recent publication, 2017, uh, that uh, goes quite in depth and all kinds of different options on grounding so that it's a useful reference to have inside. I picked this up at uh, Dayton, I think on my second last trip to Dayton. And uh, so they have, a, they have a series of recent publications uh, that uh, delve into all of this and explain it very well. So anyway, uh, that's the uh, end of the presentation. And I know Bill has a story to tell you about uh, how lightning can move around and uh, come down uh, conductor, eh, Bill? Yep, yep. <laughs> In fact, I've had a couple of occasions where uh, lightning uh, struck somewhere nearby. It uh, wasn't even noticeable to us. We were sitting at the cottage um, on the belt, uh, right on the uh, deck. And I could hear we have these outside low voltage lighting. And there was a transformer plugged in just where we were sitting. And I heard an arc when we were sitting there in the afternoon, bright blue sun and everywhere else, somewhere down the line, there was a good EMP came down that line, took that little transformer out. And in the shack, I know it was, it was uh, threatening to storm so I had disconnected everything. My radio was sitting in the boathouse, not connected to anything. No cables were connected to it. And I had another uh, radio plugged in. And when I went down and looked, uh, the, um, the little, it was a clock radio. It didn't know what it was. All of the display was all pixelated and funny looking. The radio didn't work. And uh, uh, later on, I noticed that the memories in my uh, uh, 440, HF rig were kind of scrambled and looking funny. And I had a 10 meter transmitter from Radio Shack sitting on a shelf in the, in the uh, styrofoam box. It didn't know how to transmit anymore. So I had uh, an interesting EMP come through and create difficulties like that. And uh, <laughs> the funny thing is uh, the, um, the clock radio, I, I was gonna cut the cord off and throw it in the garbage. But then I thought, ah, you know, I've heard stories about sometimes this stuff will heal itself after a while. So I just left it. And in about a month's time, it came back and the clock was working again properly. The radio never did survive, but the clock radio did. So. You should, <laughs> so have, things, should have listened to Glenn Black and you should have listened to Glenn Black and put it in a uh, metal garbage can and wrapped yeah. it in aluminum foil. Yeah, that's wow. right. That, <laughs> but you know the um, and then the, ri the original cottage got hit by lightning. Uh, it's just that's uh, probably the story that Vic was thinking about. Um, there was an old uh, TV, uh, well, not a television antenna. It was an old, probably for uh, a shortwave listening antenna up on the rock, and uh, a rusty old piece of pipe that was uh, a part of it, and a piece of about number 10 galvanized wire wrapped around. It used to be holding the pipe up, wrapped around a pine tree. And what happened there, um, 
a little over 30 years ago, we got hit, that light, the lightning hit the tree. And uh, we're sitting, the cottage is in a valley below that. It hit that tree, that wire that was wrapped around the tree conducted, and there was moss on top of the rock. So I could see the strike where the big flash and plasma arc went down across. Father-in-law liked television. He had to have a TV all the time. So we had a television antenna about 50 feet away from that and uh, a piece of RG-59 coming down and going under the cottage and up through the floor to the television set. Well, that plasma arc came down that wire from the tree uh, and they crossed at right angles. It was a bit of a wet area so that some of the uh, guy wires were directing the beam right across of the arc the hit of lightning and you could see in the grass and the moss where it had crossed the RG58. It burned off as if you had a cutting torch right at that point. The RG58 was, was a gap in it of about two inches and so I followed the cable down to the cottage and there was a splice just before it went in underneath. And now at this point, the cottage is gone. There's nothing left. It, the whole thing burned right to the ground. I looked at where the splice point, and you know what an RG58 TV uh, connection looks like. You, there's a little pin in there to carry the, the center conductor from the, uh, through the splice. It looked like the rifle bullet when I opened it up and looked in. So the current that flowed down that center conductor of RG58 set fire to the underneath the cottage. It arced underneath the cottage and set fire to it. So that totaled and took away the cottage. <laughs> wow. That's a little over 30 years ago that happened. But nobody, everybody said it got the, the lightning hit the cottage, um, you know, where it comes in at the triplex. Well, no, it didn't. <laughs> I know exactly <laughs> where it hit, but I didn't say anything about that. I let them come to their own conclusions. But, uh, you know, you never know that you think, well, and you know the little ballon that's that's the 75 ohm to 300 ohm connection for the antenna, that was perfectly intact, and it was it was closer to than the TV down at the cottage, <laughs> so it just went in that direction, and that was it. Uh, I should have taken pictures of that, but I, <laughs> I did. Bottom line is, you you cannot tell Mother Nature what to do. You can suggest <laughs> that she go in one way or another, but she's going to go where in the hell she wants to go when the hell she wants yep. to go. Yep, yep. absolutely. So yeah. there you go. That's our story. That's my story, anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, that's the hit you. that thank we took. Thank you for sharing that, Bill. I was just going to comment that uh, one of the local amateurs here, Ron Kelly. Uh, was looking for help to put an antenna system for the first time. So Luke and I uh, worked together and we uh, put in a very well grounded, properly connected, arrested antenna system, uh, which has, I guess, been working fine, eh, Luke? But we, when we were doing it, we both commented that we'd never done as good a job on our own installations as we did for Ron. So we felt really, really good about that. That was yeah. a really great presentation. Yep. It, it, it kind of like frightens me though, you know, like, uh, yeah. I had a I friend, that... I had a friend, Rusty, who was living out in Saskatchewan and I guess he was working in the barn one day and lightning storm came up and the barn had lightning arresters, you know, those little fingers sticking up along the peak of the roof. They were attached to pipes going down, I guess, to a common ground somewhere. And uh, he watched the uh, lightning come down the pipe. He was inside the barn. It came down the outside pipe, made the turn, which would have been a 90 degree turn, and then another 90 degree turn to a horizontal pipe going alongside the barn inside and it punched its way right through. It couldn't take the next 90 degree turn. It punched its, right, its way right through the wood on the outside. It probably found uh, a path of least resistance outside the barn at that point, decided to go through the wood of the but barn. But lightning arresters on the barn that I put on the barn, they go from the rod, lightning goes up that braided cable 
or whatever, uh-huh. up to the static ball that's on the lightning itself. And then that fine, fine tip point is supposed to bleed off static so that you don't okay. get that surface on the barn. But that's if you get a what direct hit, yeah, if, you if get, you get a I, direct hit. Well, most lightning goes up, even though our visual yeah. sees it coming down. Eh, because sees of it the coming fact down. That yeah. It's expanding. <laughs> okay. And it's it's going smaller as it going up, but it's come down there. But that's the idea of having those lightning arresters. The same on the house, because like I say, we were rural. Yeah. And you were the only one around. The nearest house was 1,200 feet away. I go like that, and like I say, I had a tower 65 feet with a big TH7 up on top of that, and then a Ringo Ranger up on the top of that. Yet, so I mean, it's perfect, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then I had a barn that was 80 by 40 by 80 by 40. It's an L shape. And we put lightning arresters on on that. And that was, according to the design of those, is they actually pick the lightning static that's building up in the ground around the negative, okay, mm-hmm. charges, bleeds bleed it up it into off. that little ball. And that's why people say, oh, well, yeah, I got blown off. You need those static balls up on the, co- they're collectors. Okay. okay. And they go. And then from that protrudes that very, very sharp point. Okay, the lightning, and it's supposed to bleed off the static and go in there. That's how they're supposed to work anyway. But as you said, I don't know. I think, I don't know. Sometimes you see pictures, and it looks like lightning's coming down too, and maybe it does come down as well like that. But if you're in a direct line, those MOVs I put on, they were on a welder. They were capable of carrying uh, 2,000 amp, okay, for the arc welders, and 2,000 amp at 600 volt. And that's what I had on my regular just across 120 volt lines. And in the house, Never got hit, but I know people that were just up from me going like that, and as they say, blew their clocks all the pieces. If they had a man, a radio on top of the fridge, it was toast. <laughs> Everything wow. that was plugged in was done, eh? So yeah. they really did protect your house. Yeah. So if you never get ever get hold of those, you go to a flea market and you go like, and they are big. Like I say, yeah. they're they're like this silver dollars, Yoosh. eh? Yeah. And they're thick, but they carry two thousand amp. Okay. Now it's only very, very short, short term, but so is lightning, very, very yep. short term. So by the time it bleeds all the way down and get there, but it didn't stop it from hitting. I, I don't know whether that was a near strike or a direct strike on the tower, hard to tell. Mm-hmm. They go mm-hmm. like that, but I say it did blow that coax all the shit. <laughs> one of, the, <laughs> I mean, one of the freakiest things that ever happened to me, we had just moved to Canada. We, were, we lived with my uh, father-in-law there on Anglin Street for about three months. It was the longest year of my life. But um, we, uh, I was just, uh, I opened the bedroom door to come out into the hallway, and I guess the window was open in the bathroom. And a ball of freaking lightning came in that, Bathroom window went down the hallway, made a left hand turn. You weren't having went, a pee, were you? No, no, <laughs> no. And it made the it, it made a left hand turn and it went out the open patio door. My father in law was sitting right there um, at the kitchen table just next to that patio door. And this freaking ball of lightning came down the hallway, made a left, and went out the open patio door right next to him. That was the freakiest thing I'd ever seen, man. Like you sure you didn't have witches living next door and they well, were just I mean, working some possible. of their charms? That's possible. <laughs> There's all kinds of new houses on that street now, but at the time, uh, uh, yeah. you know, it was like an open lot or something next door to his house. And I don't know where in the hell it came from, but I know <laughs> the path it took in the house and it didn't, didn't seem to hurt anything, you know, but I mean, it just whooshed right through that house just like nothing. That was the damnedest thing I'd ever seen. If your father-in-law had been lighting up a cigarette, he, he might have not have had to use the lighter. Right, exactly, yeah. right, right. Well, you know, you get those fireballs in aircraft. My dad was a, a pilot, okay, in the war, like that, and he came back and he said where he flew, and he was going like that. He said, if you flew and it was storming around and you had the canopy slightly back, because apparently you're sitting behind a 3,000 or 15, 2,000 horse engine and a lot of heat coming in and sometimes they would crack the ventilators and he said if you're in a storm with that little ventilator open you get these fireballs that come in and they first form up on the propeller Ooh. and he said you can see the traces going around and they go like that and then it'll fly off and if there's an open window it'll come in and he said it's just like the size of a hardball 
and it bounces all over the aircraft in there. And, and he said, you take you go back down and they can see all the burns where it hit the frame. And they have to go and go through all that and replace those pieces that it got like that. But he said, talk about something. This thing is dancing all over the place. He says, going like that. And he said, there's nothing you can do about it once it's in the aircraft. He said, so you learn very quickly. If you're in any kind of stormy weather, a lot of cloud, any buildup like that, you made sure that all your little windows and doors and you put up with the friggin' heat and it could be 140 in that <laughs> cockpit. But he said, you, <laughs> you, you still flew with those windows closed because you knew that if you saw that, yeah. I forget what they call that lightning ball that forms around the propeller, right? Because like it's static. Like a really. corona or something. Yeah. yeah, it's like yeah. a corona effect. Yeah, and it goes around like that. And he said, and that'll fly off. It, and if there's any opening in the aircraft, it'll come in. And yeah. he says, oh, like this follows so the cool. fuselage down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This he said, it's a but, scary place when you got this thing ripping around inside there like that. Yeah. And he's luckily he was never burned by it. It seemed to go to metal, to metal, to metal, to metal, eh? And yeah. not touch him. But he said, it's pretty spooky. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's one thing, Rusty, what you said about the. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. We certainly can. Okay. No, can't hear you at all, Dennis. No, it's, it's just how, the howdy doody time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Roger D. Yeah, Roger D. All right, <laughs> Rusty. When you said that the uh, ball went through the hallway, and that I remember my mom. This was when I was young. My mom. Every time there was a storm, my mom would close all the windows. And I said, I remember that like it was yesterday. I said, Why do you do that? She says, Because if there's lightning, it'll go through where the airflow is. So if you got a window open on the east side and a window open on the west side, it'll come right through out to the other side. That's exactly coming. what happened. It came in an open yeah. window and went out an open door. I don't yeah. know what the hell would it, it might not even come in the house if the patio door had been closed. Yeah. You know, Here's but, the, uh, yeah. yeah. That's what she kept saying in that. Eh? I never seen it happen, but anyways, she kept the windows closed when there was a storm, but I, she was, born too on the farm and that and, and this and that but anyways coming back I remember my buddy that lived at the end of the street there on Carmen Street off the South Boulevard uh, a lightning hit his clothesline and the clothesline was attached to the house like he had the post at the other end and uh, on the house he had one of those u-hooks there you know the, the ones that you turn into a two by four or whatever and the lightning hit the clothesline went down the clothesline, went into that U-bolt, uh, not U-bolt, U-screw there, whatever it is, I-bolt, and went through the wall and hit the bathtub. That was the washroom wall on the Ooh. other side. And it went, and you could see where the lightning hit the tub, the big black mark on the tub. Wow. And his clothesline was <laughs> ripped right apart. Yeah, yeah found, good thing. Found the ground, found the yeah. house ground. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that yeah. bathtub is, you know, like metal, porcelain covered metal or whatever. So, it yeah, was, it's it's what grounded it too. yeah, probably so yeah. is the clothesline. They weren't usually that, uh, like aircraft cable, eh? The stainless, exactly. Steel. He worked, he worked that now they cover them with, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, scared, I scared the hell out of my mother one rainy Saturday afternoon, uh, probably about 10 years old or so getting bored by the having to stay in the house, eh? So I went in the, their bedroom window, mom and dad's bedroom window, and I opened everything up so that we just had the screens open. And then I started lining the window with tin foil. <laughs> she came in, what are you doing? I says, I'm trying to attract some lightning. <laughs> Scared the hell out of her. <laughs> One of my customers, um, she, uh, when her kids were growing up, it was getting ready to storm. So she went outside and she got the kids and it was raining and she uh, got the kids in the house. You know, they're all sitting around the kitchen table and she just came in the house and took off her wet raincoat and the phone rang and she picked up the phone. Of course, it was a corded phone back then and it had like a long cord on it and she kind of twisted around that the cord was kind of like wrapped around her body type oh. thing and lightning hit the phone line and came Ooh. through, blew the kids right off the kitchen table, you know, right? They were sitting around the kitchen table, blew them away. And she had, of course, she had burn marks going all around her body. And uh, it, uh, her, her hair, her head was hurting or whatever. And she went to the doctor or whatever, and they kind of, you know, moved her hair back or whatever. They, 
they she had a, a it looked like a great big snowflake like almost a tattoo on the top of her head from that that lightning did that to the top of her head you know so she's probably lucky to be alive i know one guy that got hit by lightning twice twice in his life he got to he was on he was in some kind of an old vehicle it had a like a six volt electrical system setting out by big lake watching a storm and that that car got hit by lightning um he was he used to work at the old hospital in little current and it was a uh, dark and stormy night you know whenever he got off and anyway he's putting his motorcycle leaving little current just going up the hill and he was in the bike apparently was geared very low and he was going slow up the hill and he got hit by lightning. He didn't realize it was lightning at the time. He said it felt like a million little spiders with needles for legs were walking up his, 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 his legs, you know, and he was paralyzed. He couldn't move. He could, he could barely, he managed, the bike was going slow enough. He managed to get it turned around and headed back into little current. And he ran the motorcycle into the side of the building to stop it. And he crawled, crawled up to the door and banged on the door with his helmet or whatever. You know, that dude should go buy a lottery ticket because, like I said, he got hit by lightning twice in his life. Yeah. So, Vic, it sounds like part of the deal is just something is better than nothing mm -hmm. and do the best you can. It sounds like antenna lore, right? I mean, something's better than nothing. And, you know, if a meteor is going to come out of the sky and get you, well, okay, but don't piss off Mother Nature. No. <laughs> Janice, just think, Janice, just throw money at it. Yeah, <laughs> think, thinking uh, precautions is uh, always good, and that was wonderful, Vic. Thank you. Oh, you're yes, welcome. For, Thanks uh, very much, Vic. For, for I'm glad, I, glad I could share that because uh, it is something that we need a refresher on occasionally, and uh, awesome. maybe motivate a few people to look more carefully at their particular situation and. Uh, I, I, I think I'm going to make a solemn vow that I'm going to try really hard this year. Yeah. <laughs> Can you uh, hold up your polyphaser again or your lightning arrester uh, just so people can have a look at it again. I'm just going to tell a little story about these uh, devices and that because it's, it, it kind of hits home what's been happening recently on the repeater. Okay, uh, so you see, this is what they call another famous word or a company is polyphaser that makes them on all our antennas on the Manitoulin Club. We have one of the, that. That's good, Vic. Uh, thank you. I think everybody. Uh, this this one is made by Alpha Delta, by the way. Alpha Delta. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we have those at the CBC Tower site, at McLean's Mountain Tower site, at LTR. Uh, I'm not sure if the guys up in Elliott Lake have one connected to TOP or not. But what happened, <laughs> and uh, Vic uh, mentioned in relation to um, static buildup charges, and Rusty will remember this, we had a whole issue with the uh, CBC tower. We were getting static, and recently people have been saying when they checked into the round table in the morning, I'm hearing kind of static crackling noises on some of the signals and, and that with it. What tends to happen is um, there's a discharge, not necessarily um, at your, uh, at the tower or the, with the repeater, or your, it could be your own antenna that's building up that static discharge there and it's coming out the radio, or if you're on a handheld and you're hearing it, it could be the atmosphere around you. So let me just share something with you. We were getting terrible noise on the RMI repeater. And we were looking at various different uh, things to see what the heck is going on. Now you're talking about grounding and you're talking about various different things. These are the guide wires on the uh, 500 foot CBC tower. There are about four or five guide wires that come down to a base and they're done with turnbuckles to keep the tension going. Now, to keep the turnbuckles from evolving or, or rotating, they had a metal wire that went through the holes of the turnbuckle that if you can see here. And 
we were wondering what the heck is going on. So when it gets windy, and I'll turn the volume up and hopefully you can hear this, but listen to what happens. I had a handheld on RMI's frequency standing right beside with my cell phone and listen to the volume. You're going to hear the crackling and watch what happens when I move that cable. Let me try it here. Did you hear that kind of crackling noise that was going? I'll play it again so you can hear it one more time. Listen very carefully and see if you hear the crackling and watch what happens when I shake the crackling increases. Okay, so. So what was happening when it got windy, of course that metal is rubbing against metal and it, it's static buildup. It's a, the discharge that's being built up on the tower and what's happening is it's also coming down and you, if you listen very closely on the CBC signal at 97.5, you could hear that crackling at the same as in RMI. So eventually what we, ended up doing, we kept complaining to CBC, they sent a rigger up and sure enough, it was all corroded at the top of uh, one of the guide wires that was creating this noise. And then they came and they replaced this cable with a plastic coating cable. And once they did that- It's supposed to be insulated. That's supposed to so you don't have metal on metal contact. That's right. You take two pieces of metal and you rub them together and that, 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 that makes noise. Well, exactly, and that that created a lot of a uh, lot of issues uh, with it. So it's really important to try and ground it. Now, I don't have polyphasers on all my antennas here at the house, but because we're up on a commercial tower like that, uh, uh, we do have them on all the antennas and grounded to a bus, a grounding bus, and uh, the the two inch uh, strapping at the... Uh, yeah, and we are grounded at uh, TOP as well. Okay, that's that's always good, especially in commercial sites like that. It, uh, it's really important. You know, I mean, everybody is going to, it's, it's part of amateur life. Now, luckily, touch wood, if you've never been touched by electricity or uh, uh, lightning, I was, unfortunately, I... Uh, we were getting a lightning storm coming in here and Judy was saying the lightning's happening you better go down disconnect your antennas right so I went down I was in the shack and I started unscrewing each connector and I could hear the <coughs> outside and everything and I had just got the last connector off when all of a sudden I started to feel the little hairs in the back of my neck go up and all of a sudden, crack. It hit the uh, comet vertical on the top of my, there was fiberglass splinters all over the back lawn and everything. It came down, I hit the ground. It didn't, you know. And of course it came in hydro too, but luckily I only had one or two items. There was a scanner that was connected that I'd forgotten that it had been uh, connected uh, to an antenna. But luckily all my radios were saved because I disconnected now. Remember it blew a fuse in your rotor control box. That's you right. Did, you didn't even know that fuse was in there. We took the lid off of it and replaced that fuse and the rotor control box came back to life, so. Back to life. And, yeah. But I, um, your home insurance policies, um, you know, uh, they were very good because I took due diligence. If you take a little bit, and if you get a, you know, a adjuster that comes out to the house, you show them the tower, said there was grounding here. And, you know, I showed them the, uh, the setup in the shack. Now this was 10 or 15 years ago, but uh, it's a bit of a pain, but they did replace everything luckily. But uh, yeah, you take your chance, you know, that's, uh, that's the only thing. Now I've got to remember to unplug 
you know, hydro. Tables now and uh, make sure, hydro. especially if, and hydro. If um, the nice thing about it is I've got a, uh, a switch uh, at the p panel, so I can flip that switch off and everything in this shack shuts down. So that's a, that's a good thing. Yeah, but if it can jump a six or eight foot uh, gap on coax, what's going to keep it from walking across a break? Well, I just ordered 10 garbage cans and about 50 uh, uh, boxes of aluminum foil. So I would be.